thanks for being here um, for the first and uh, I hope not last edition of uh, the Web Students Warmup. Um, so I'm Pierre Simon, uh, one of the co-founders of Silicon Students, and Florian, which is behind the, the camera, which is the other co-founder. Um, so Silicon Students is really uh, an organization launched in July 2011 really made at building a community for students, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, who really interested uh, about web and the tech industry. Um, so we uh, gather, we have strong online and offline community throwing events and connecting online. And we really try to have core value around um, fostering entrepreneurship for young students, um, giving the taste of taking the leap, taking to action uh, for students and also gather people from different academic background. So we're really happy to have you here and to also to have Jeff uh, Clavier and uh, Andrew uh, Power from, and his team at PageLines. They come from the Silicon Valley just for you and for another conference called the web, but uh, it's not the main one. And um, so um, after that, we're gonna also have uh, three students, uh, three um, country represented for a student entrepreneurship, Norway, Algeria, and Germany. And also the, um, the contest for the low web giveaway, um, the page light te teams will announce the three, um, the three people that are gonna be, have the, the opportunity to, to pitch for a plus, uh, a plus for the web. So right now I'm gonna talk um, too much and I let the, the mic to, to Jeff. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, for being here, and uh, I'll leave you the, the stage. Thank you so much for having me, Simon. Um, so I'm Jeff Clavier. I'm French, but yes, I speak English and Franklish. It's been 11 years over there, but I still haven't lost my French accent. Um, works with the girls. Um, what I want to do is to go through a few things that Simon and I have discussed uh, before jumping into the Q&A, so really, because uh, the goal is not for you to listen to the sound of my voice, but to actually get hopefully some useful information and then uh, jump into what the sort of topics that might be of interest to you. So uh, very brief background. Um, I'm actually um, a um, C++ hacker turned uh, master of science in computing and distributed computing uh, back in France. That led me to do a startup in the financial services market uh, back, in, back in 89, were acquired uh, by Reuters. And so I started as a developer and then ended up as, as a CTO. And after a, a um, roughly 12 year stint in the financial services market, I ended up in the Valley as um, what we would call a traditional VC. Did that for four years and then um, my passion turned to Web2 investing right at the beginning, before it was fashionable back in 2004, when there was literally um, one or two handfuls of us actually investing in those startups. And um, so I became an angel investing my own money um, in 2004, was sort of uh, elected uh, sort of a super angel back in 2006, um, and um, uh, really turned to bec becoming a micro VC in, um, in 2010. And I'll try and highlight what that means. In terms of the firm, which I've um, started in the Valley, Softec VC, it's now um, seven and a half years old. It's managing three funds. First one was just my money. Second fund was a $15 million fund. Uh, the third one is a $50 million fund. It has made 112 investments in, um, in seven years. Roughly these days, we do about 20-ish investments uh, a year. And um, since I know many of you might have the question for me, which is do you invest in Europe? The answer is kind of no, because out of the 112, as you can see, two were in Europe, and this sort of, one is an old um, Android investment of mine, Wikio, and Songkick um, is based in London, and those guys essentially got me to invest by sort of suggesting they might actually move to the US one day, and as soon as we funded them, actually say, oh, we actually stay in London. <laughs> Don't lie. Um, but it's actually very cool because it makes sense for what they do to be in London or New York. Uh, we had uh, 22 exits. Um, we've had over 60 companies that uh, received follow-on investments from VCs after us for about $820 million. So we're getting cool to a you know, we're getting close to a cool billion, uh, which is cool. 
And as I said, we're investing out of a $50 million fund now, uh, which has already made 23 investments since, um, since the beginning of the year. So we're definitely um, on track with our target. And there's now a team of four working in the fund. Up until the end of last year, I was on my own. So I closed uh, 92 investments uh, just by myself. Um, those are just a few of the exits we've, um, we've had. So we sold a few companies to you know, the likes of Yahoo, Intuit, um, got some shares in Facebook and Twitter and Groupon. So we've been doing, uh, we've been doing okay. Um, those are the um, investments that we've made. I mean, there's actually a few more, but those are the ones we've disclosed in Fund3. And that gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we invest in. Uh, the most um, interesting area for us these days will be uh, mobile services, um, e-commerce, especially next generation e-commerce, and um, um, sort of vertical SaaS, uh, so this sort of bit in the bottom. So a couple of things um, since um, a lot of what we talk about in um, in those sort of general discussions really depend and change uh, quite a bit from one startup to the next. And so those are sort of general points. Remember that your startup will be different and will be a specific case. So just, you know, don't apply any of this sort of stricto sensu, just think about what that means for you. And also different investors, if you have, you know, a few of us from the Valley stepping on the stage and talking to you, will sort of have a different point of view and different approach. Um, this is really Silicon Valley and consumer internet startup centric. If ever you develop something in, I don't know, a pure software, you know, somewhere in the stack or some hardware, most of this might not apply because capital efficiency is really one of the main drivers of what we do. And a lot of those companies might not you know, have this sort of capital efficient notion where you can prove a company on half a million dollars. Um, yeah, if you look at the companies which have passed on, uh, like LinkedIn, you'll see I'm a total idiot. Um, so remember that. And unfortunately, the way things are done in Europe will definitely be different from what I'm used to. For example, just one token um, example. It's very common in Europe that um, investors will ask you, you know, what you think about your exit opportunity and sort of when that might happen and who would be the companies that might acquire you. Fair enough. If you put that in a Silicon Valley pitch, you just shut yourself in the foot because we build you know, big companies without thinking about the exit when we meet with you at seed stage. So you know, just on that point, there is a clear difference between the way you do things here versus there. One of the questions that I was asked to um, talk about is how we evaluate startups. And there's sort of a very simple and sometimes simplistic framework that um, I've come up with over the years, uh, which I call the three asses rule. What that means is we're basically looking for a smart ass team that is building a kick ass product in a big ass market. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the way we think about things um, at SoftTech. And clearly, the biggest ass is the team, then the product, then the market. And you know, this is sort of conceptual, so don't pull a DSK on me, no touching. Um, and just to prove that this is actually for real, this is actually um, the strategy slide or website, and you can see the three assets rule being explained. And then you have the book, Do More Faster, which I actually recommend to any uh, entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur. It's actually an excellent book, and we managed to actually get the three assets rule in the book. I was very happy with that. So what does that mean? Um, First, the smartest team, the most important characteristic in what we look at is the team and how passionate and relevant and you know, what sort of composition they have. And we, come up, you know, we came up with this um, 3Ds uh, notion which summarizes what we look for. This is one of my companies, Gigwalk, a recent Fund3 investment. And when I saw those guys walk into my office uh, in November of last year, so a bit more than a year ago, I just had this, this revelation of having those guys with a 3Ds on their forehead. Why? Because Matt, the CTO, has the D of development. So technology, a guy who's excellent at building, managing, and scaling stuff. The other D is David for design. And when you build consumer internet um, 
services or applications or you know whether they're web-based or mobile, interaction design and experience design is extremely important to create you know essentially this pleasure uh, that if ever you're using Instagram as a, as a product, you might you might feel where the product is so good you really enjoy um, using it. And the last D is distribution. How do you get users? How do you sell to users? And how do you retain them? And basically, the three Ds is what we try and look for in terms of um, skill set and experience in founding teams. In the case of GigWalk, we have three dudes who actually have the three characteristics and three skills amongst themselves. Sometimes you might have one or two guys or gals who have those, um, those skills. When we think about a Kikas product, there's a set of questions we're going to ask ourselves. And it's better to answer satisfactorily to each of um, those questions, but what matters is that we understand that you've asked yourself those questions and you have either the experience and expertise to actually um, solve those issues, or you have already sort of figured out how to test a few assumptions and a few solutions. So one of the first things that um, we try and figure out is what is, you know, what is motivating you, what is driving you to build this startup? And typically, we have nothing against you know, some people who have looked at 10 different ideas and then you know, elected to build one company because of those 10 ideas because it, was, it seemed to be the best one, but we'd rather see a deep passion of something that the founders want to build for themselves and their friends and their families because that basically will mean long-term commitment to that idea. Um, Aspirin, not vitamin, um, so basically solving a real pain point, not something which is so nice, you know, must have, not nice to have, something which is solving someone's real, you know, issue. Um, we want to see what the initial, what we call customer validation, or customer development and validation you've done, which is who amongst your customers have you already sort of um, talked to, what sort of uh, tests have you made, you know, to um, figure out whether you can bring users to um, homepage or you know just buying some um, uh, Google ads or Facebook ads to a landing page just to figure out some very basic conversion it can be done for you know five hundred dollars or whatever so it's pretty easy to actually do that and likewise once you've done that um, we want to understand whether you you are really um, a master of the uh, user funnel uh, sort of conversions and, and economics and obviously at the very beginning you don't know all you know, in detail all this, but we want to make sure that you actually have a good clue as to how to establish them, how to figure them out. Because you don't do this after building the product. You do this before building the product and as you sort of iterate around it. Likewise, we don't expect you to actually already make money. It actually happens that we invest at seed stage with companies which are already producing, you know, some non-trivial revenues and, and in very few cases, um, they actually are already profitable when we invest in them. They just are profitable at small scale. Um, so figure out how you think about monetization <clears throat> and building a business out of uh, this company that you, you want to um, you know, spend the next five to seven years of your life you know, uh, building. We want to make sure that there is actual, um, a real business there. Um, we tend to be really business focused. We will we'll sometimes um, invest in those uh, traffic type plays where you build, you know, a launch community and a bunch of users and then you'll figure out one day how to make money. Not really good for us. Um, likewise, many people try to um, take something and say, hey, I have, this is a like this with a twist or with something which is slightly different and better. I mean, for us, differentiation has to be sort of real. It has to be so much better that it's, it's uh, 100 times or 1,000 times better. The, uh, the incremental um, evolution or innovation isn't interesting to us. Um, we want to see how you're going to measure both success and figure out uh, what we call cohorts. So I'm not sure whether you guys are talking about cohort analysis, but it's basically how you can look at your users um, in classes, for example, the people who have joined, you know, in September and then October and then November, so that you can see how changes in the product can affect your conversion and time on site and any actually metric that you figured out. 
This is really important to our master. If you don't do that, and you only look at your users, you know, uh, holistically as um, as a group, um, you won't really understand how changes that you're making to the site or the service impact uh, your retention or your conversion. And then we'll want to understand understand what it means to take this this website or service or application that you have at let's say 10,000 users when, when um, you come to see us, what does that mean to have 10 million? What does that mean from a cost perspective? What does that mean from a scale perspective, from a you know, management perspective and so on? So. And this is really what we look at sort of having already done before you come and raise money. Question? Can I interrupt you with a question now? Or we to... um, let's just uh, keep that, park that, and then we'll get back to you. Um, so, and we can come back with the slides. Um, so yes, this is sort of what we expect from you. Not everything, but a lot of this will be a set of questions we'll ask when we meet you and, and sort of dig deep into your company as a diligence before we invest. The reason why we, uh, we expect all this to be done is that the cost of building startup has dropped you know, from 5 million into 1,000-ish time frame to 500,000 in 2005 time frame to now 50 to 100K. And we expect that this can either be self-financed or you have sort of means to figure out, you know, friends and family, you know, financing or something like that before you actually come and raise uh, professional money. Biggest market, those are a set of tests, um, which is sort of the big enough stress test. What does it mean for this company based on what you're pitching us to be a $100 million company? Obviously, at that time, we have no clue. And... The test is more understanding the assumptions, the, you know, how many million users and what sort of conversions and what sort of, you know, average buys, if it's a transaction system, does it take for this company to $100 million company in five to seven years? So it's very arbitrary, but a lot of times, as far as we're concerned, uh, we'll say, look, this is interesting, but not big enough. The reason why this is important is that when you raise capital from people, people like myself, you create an expectation of return which is sort of up on your shoulders as you build the company. So let's say that you take $2 million at 8 pre, 10 posts, you know, to build your company. Mentally, the person who has committed to you will have roughly at that stage a 10x expectation, which means that by taking that cash, the guy who gives it to you expects that you're going to return that 10 times 20 million, which means that the company you're going to build is at least $100 million. If ever the company that you're building has no way, and sometimes you can build what, what is called a lifestyle business, um, which, you know, is fine. Many people can make a good living out of a lifestyle business, and there's no shame whatsoever in building a lifestyle business. The issue is that this should not be something that you raise money from people like myself for, because you won't be able to um, fulfill that expectation. So for you guys, trying to figure out you know, what it means to be a European entrepreneur. And I appreciate that you know, some, for, for some, the easy solution seems to be sort of moving to the US, like I've done. Um, think about a few things. One is the complexity of the European system is actually an advantage. Because before the, um, you know, my home is in the US, think about uh, the US. The company will be like four to five years old. Because if ever a two-year-old you know, startup CEO comes to me and says, I want to tackle Europe, I will likely slap him in the face. Because they have to build a real footprint in the US uh, before doing so. And so because of this you know, multiplicity of tax structures and culture and language, um, this is sort of an advantage you can build a real company into. I would say uh, Wonga is a good example of that. Likewise, there is such a um, level of competition on resources in the US right now that Building a company which is sort of global in mindset but starts in Europe with a very strong development technology backend here and eventually moving you know, sales and marketing and CEO to the US could be a very smart way of doing it. Uh, think Spotify. Um, if you want to build something like that, you need to sort of think about a really big idea that is sort of global, at least US and, and Europe, you know, uh, sort of crossovers, and it's okay to test locally, you know, at least at the very beginning, but you have to expand very, very quickly. The usual sort of 
French way of doing things, at least when we started ourselves, was to build you know, a French version of our thing and then set it in Switzerland and set it in Belgium and then you know, figure out how we could you know, maybe move to, um, to London. And, 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 and by the time you've done that, it's just too late. So you have to think about something which expands from your initial test market to you know, something much bigger very, very quickly because competition these days lights up extremely fast. And likewise, you know, the European, some European markets are well known to sort of develop knockoffs. And to be honest, there's no shame in building a knockoff if you think that you can actually do your own you know, version of Groupon very successfully or whatever. But ask yourself two questions. One is, what is the exit? And if there's already one being built successfully, is there really sort of a, a, a place or space or an opportunity for uh, the third or fifth or seventh iteration of a US knockoff? Finally, um, talking about uh, raising capital, you have two options. One is starting the US, and as far as CD is concerned, you have a few opportunities or ways to do it. You can you know, bootstrap uh, your way, and you have to sort of bootstrap your way into you know, the initial product. Then go see you know, local angels, um, you know, think about SeedCamp, which is a European accelerator. Uh, there's a couple of micro VCs or seed programs, unfortunately not in um, in France, per se, to the best of my knowledge, besides Isai, but you know, in the in the UK, you have a couple. In uh, Germany, you have a couple. And then, for most of you, raising money in uh, in Europe uh, will be sort of the way. For the most successful, having built you know a certain footprint, uh, which is in buzz uh, on a global level, think um, SoundCloud. My friend Alex Long managed to get you know, mighty Fred Wilson to invest in him. And Fred Wilson typically doesn't invest in Europe. So he did a really good job at building something which was convincing. Um, and you got a Series A from two really strong firms. And eventually, you, know, you get your Series B in the US, because this is where you can get the scale and eventually the exit. If you want to start in the US, and many people will say, hey, can I just you know, fly over and get funded? Uh, it's actually feasible because you know 50% of the people in the valley actually speak English with a funny accent like mine, and so it's definitely fine to be sort of local uh, as you as um, as a European immigrant. But you have to move to the U.S. to become local, which means you actually get you actually have to get your ass over there and sort of become part of the community. And it's not happening with two trips. It's a, it's basically a commitment where you move there, become local, and then you know you're a local entity and you can just do your thing. And because of the issues of cost and visa, because unfortunately the, the US isn't as open as I'd like them to be in terms of uh, visa for entrepreneurs, um, you know, the solution might be to find a company like Google or Facebook or Twitter or whoever is big and is trying desperately to find uh, good engineering resources, and the French are really good at that. Um, you move over there, you know, get your visa sorted out, and then once you're there, you can actually leverage all the uh, community, figure out co-founders, and, and become an entrepreneur. But yes, uh, no one will pay for you to move. No one's going to say, yeah, sure, you know, here's 50 grand and you guys can sort of, uh, here is a per diem you know, as you guys move. No, we're looking, the entrepreneurship in the US is about, is about commitment, blood, sweat, and tears. And we want to see that. And so you're going to have to get your ass over there and you know, make this happen if you're really uh, wanting to. That's a hurdle you have to go through. That's it, about 17 minutes. So now, questions. See, the the main problem now is to validate that mm -hmm. we have a kick-ass product. And yep. how do we do that? We have to build an awesome product. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, we find problems like legal establishment. So if our product requires people to pay, uh, just for us to test the product, and to validate it to VCs or even friends and family or business angels. For me, that's a problem because I can't really validate. I have to establish first. So how do I solve that lengthy process of building a, an awesome product and, and, and getting established? So the first thing that you will try is to validate demand for the product. So when I was saying try and figure out um, some marketing campaigns or um, AdWords campaign or Facebook campaigns, depending on your specific, what would work for your specific product, that drives people to a survey. So you basically go through the customer discovery, clicks, conversion, survey, and 
eventually you get information from those users, and at the end you ask, if we were to build this sort of product we've described in that survey, what would be the likely you know, price point you would pay for this? And we look at this as at least the bare minimum proof point of you having figured out two things. One is, how do I drive traffic and conversion to, from my, you know, from ads to my website, to my product, and this is sort of what we could get in terms of price point. It's not much, but it's the bare minimum you can do, because I agree, if you, build, if you have to build the whole, the whole damn product to actually market it, then you know, it's kind of difficult to, it's a chicken and egg issue. However, in some cases, um, you might be able to get some customers who really want this to be early adopters and pay for you know, the product in advance and you give them a deep discount, 30%, 50%. And if you come to me and say, we have you know, a bunch of customers committed and we've given them a 50% discount for them to pay up front and they've done it, it's a huge sign of, of market interest. Um, and sometimes you can bootstrap your way into it. We, we recently funded a company, it's not disclosed yet. Um, those guys have been bootstrapping for a couple of years. They had you know, some savings and that's what they spent their um, uh, two years you know, sort of living on. And they built a, a product that got 50 customers uh, and they got like 10 to 15 grand per customer per year. So, which means that when they came to me for funding, they already had 50 customers and they had like a close to a million dollar in revenue. It's very convincing. Question? Yeah. Um, wait for the mic because we have people sort of on the, um, on the web. I think it's, I'm not saying that you have to go to the valley to set up a company. I'm just saying that if you're European entrepreneurs, you have two typical ways of getting it, getting it funded, which is um, this, that's all. But it's really feasible to build a success in, in Europe. And I really have a lot of, of uh, respect for the entrepreneurs who actually make it happen because it's much harder here than over there. Mm -hmm. Can we then come to uh, the US to show that our uh, um, uh, way of thinking about uh, the research is the big problem that people want to be one when they use our product? Um, so can we come back to the US and can we talk to the VCs? If, if ever you've reached a certain level of penetration in Europe yeah. and, and your product is truly global, there might be a discussion to be had. but. Typically, you know, to get to a European expansion, you will have had to raise money already yeah. here. So that's why I said, you know, you're basically option one, which is raise your seed and your A here, and then, you know, your B potentially in your, uh, sorry, in the US. Okay. Hi, I would like to know for you, how important is traction uh, when you start to think about uh, investing in a company? Because we can really easily be in a chicken and egg problem mm -hmm. where, well, uh, for example, for my business, it's really important that we have a big user acquisition. And this can take a lot of time because you have this hockey stick growth and uh, you can ask yourself, well, sh shall we uh, raise money right now? Or shall we wait till we start to have big traction? Uh, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's difficult to answer you know, abstract, uh, in an abstract way because it really depends on, on the collection of factors. So think about the decision process we, uh, we go through as sort of a scale. And for each of the characteristics we talked about, the team, the product, the market opportunity, the traction, the uh, user acquisition, what you've proven, so on and so forth, as different types of weight that go on the scale. And they will have, you know, all have different you know, shapes and size and so on and so forth. And at some point, as we add all those weights, you know, the scale might tip. And in our case, the scale tips 0.5% of the time. We see roughly two to 300 opportunities a month. We meet 30 to 45. We work on 10, dig in really deeply in five, and invest in zero, one, or two a month. So the scale and tipping that often. But that's sort of the way to think about it, which is if it's really important for you to have a very efficient user acquisition funnel, we're going to spend a lot of time on that, understanding the mechanics and what you've tested. Obviously, 
you know, the example I gave uh, of this company, which already had, you know, 50 customers and close to a million dollars in revenue is kind of a no-brainer. Duh, you know, it's kind of, why are you guys raising a seed round? Well, because we have, you know, a bunch of things to, um, to test and then we'll go to a $10 million, you know, Series A, which is sort of almost ideal for us. But it doesn't happen all the time. So when we meet, we try and understand, you know, the discussion is this is what we've proven, this is what the seed round will, you know, allow us to prove to the guys coming after, after us, which will hopefully invest, you know, five to seven to ten million dollars. And so we try and, and understand whether this is sort of worthy as an opportunity of the risk we'll be taking because, you know, of, of this sort of monster company that you might, um, you might build. And sometimes we'll take a lot of risk on the basis of very limited, you know, uh, proof and sometimes we'll need, you know, a lot of proof before actually committing. It really depends. <clears throat> Thanks. Hi. So our situation is is a bit bizarre. We came up with the idea of, a, and I'd like to pick your brain on who could fund this type of project. Mm -hmm. uh, we we came up with a, an idea for a global airline platform. Mm -hmm. where it, let's say it takes a million dollar just to make it simple to to create it. But we said no one is going to give us a million dollar to do it and then go and try to get airlines. Mm -hmm. So we first went and got airlines. And we got one of the three biggest airlines. And they say, great, we want it. We want to integrate it by April next year. But now we don't have it. So we so is there a way to get them to pay for it? Like, um, commit, like you know, commit to certain milestones. You guys build the product. They, they sort of pay for, you know, for some of it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Because that, that would be, for those kinds of, of products that involve big clients, that would be the way. You know, I would try to ninja my funding because um, typically when you have just one customer, it's great. It's good news that you have one. Bad news is that you only have one. And so unless it's a market client that will sort of help you def uh, rebuild something which is okay for the industry, I think there's always sort of a, a little bit of risk with them. But I would try and get that customer to pay if they really want it, especially if they impose a deadline on you. Question? Simon, you tell me when to stop, right? Nice to see you again, Jeff. How you doing? Uh, really well, thanks. Uh, question is, you said you passed on LinkedIn. You're yes. like, oh, we were idiots. Can you explain what LinkedIn looked like at that time that made you pass on it as a company that went by? Well, me to her, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. So LinkedIn 2003, early 2004, I think they have um, a few, I don't remember exactly the, um, the numbers, but I'm still in the run for the first guy with 50 connections. Um, there's no concept, I mean, business networking is sort of brand new. Uh, we have at that time Rise and LinkedIn and a few others. And I love the product, I, I love Reed as a founder. I had uh, two issues, one is I wasn't clear that this was gonna be sort of the monster it is now, and I didn't think they were gonna be able to sort of monetize this thing uh, the way they do. And so, like uh, Dumbass actually, you know, passed. But that's what we do. We look at, you know, what's in front of us. And I can't say that I was, well, obviously I was wrong, but I can't say that I can blame myself for the reason that I passed, you know, on, you know, I passed on Foursquare because I didn't see the long-term retention on Foursquare back in, you know, July 2009. And I still don't see the long-term retention on Foursquare. And it's still not a business, even though it has a valuation of, whatever, 600 million, and it was like worth three, three pre when I looked at it. But the, those are sort of the, that's the way we sort of think about things. And um, if I could, but I can say that if I could go back in time and change one thing, that would be my decision on LinkedIn. <laughs> but I can't, so who cares? Other question? Is it true that you never read emails? <laughs> No, when, we, when, when we send business plan to your uh, when we send business plan to your uh, email address on uh, Softech VC. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I spend I spend my life on email. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we so yeah the the whole the whole notion of uh, using you know pitches at softechvc.com, um, we actually take a look at those. But if you ask me, how many companies have we funded over the past seven years? You know that came through pitches at softechvc.com. Guess the answer. Yeah, yeah. And so. We sort of look at it when we have time, because at the end of the day, one, remember this sort of notion of um, commitment, blood, sweat, and tears? Yeah. Well, part of that is to figure out how you actually get attention from a uh, venture capitalist, which is typically using someone you know, they know, who's in between, yeah, yeah. and will make sort of a, a referral 
that <laughs> will allow you to get above the attention. Because think about my inbox as something which is just filled with you know 20 or 30 pitches a day. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. so you know to raise above that crowd, you need to find someone who I deeply trust who recommends uh, you know your uh, your company. So to have a funding in the U.S., you have really have to um, be uh, famous. Uh, in uh, the Bay Area? No. No? Wow. No, you just have to know. Basically, that's, that's, that's the, um, the social proof or the proxy that I'm talking about. Yeah. You need to know someone who knows me, and LinkedIn is actually a great tool for that. Yeah. You need to know someone who knows me will say, you know, that dude is building something which is amazing, and this is why I think you should look at it based on what you know, you're building, which is why you have to find someone who truly knows me because yeah. there's a bunch of people who claim they know me. Yeah. And when I get the email, I go like, who the fuck is that? So, you know, typically, as I said, LinkedIn is actually a good proxy because I never connect to people who actually haven't met in the past. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much and um, best of luck. Thank you.